Good morning. Thank you for coming on this beautiful day. And um, welcome to our program. I'm Kathy Rooney, the chair of the Ashland Town Forest at the Ashland Town Forest Committee, and this is Laura Matei, the Director of Stewardship for Sudbury Valley Trustees. Our Town Forest and Sudbury Valley Trustees, we share um, the larger land mass, if you will. So we're, at this point, almost about 600 acres. Um, so the Cossack Woods, which Sudbury Valley Trustees own, integrates into the Ashland Town Forest, and Laura and I have worked together over the years to organize volunteers for stewardship efforts coordinate events such as these and connect people to our incredible natural resource. So today we're talking about our forest stewardship plan um, and how uh, that uh, creates habitat um, and also in the process of creating habitat it also um, changes how we perceive the land. So as we're thinking about that land as habitat, it's also food and home for birds, amphibians, mammals, large and small and it shifts the perception value of the land. It's not just land, and it's just not just pretty open space anymore. It has other um, values. So in discovering that our forest is a habitat, we also recognize its inherent value as both a clean air and water filter as a place where stormwater stays in the land and inf infiltrates into our aquifers, providing a continuing source of clean filtered water for all of our use creating open space or contributing land to an adjacent or abutting open space parcel exponentially adds to the inherent and habitat values of the conjoined parcels. Landscapes with high species and structural diversity, a well-functioning, healthy, and regenerating forests, which we'll be addressing today, have pest populations 100 times lower than forests with simple, less complex structural diversity. Different insect growth stages require different host plants as larvae than as their final stages as butterflies or beetles. This is especially true for caterpillars, which are a prime bird food. The varied structural diversity is not only above the forest floor, but added in the leaf litter and the duff layer as many insects lay eggs there that get eaten by birds, small mammals, and amphibians. Under the forest floor, the complexity and life continues as many insects, small creatures make their homes there, but only if they have food, foraging areas, shelter, and nesting sites. All of us humans, animals, and insects require plants to live. Lack of plants and diversity of plants creates less of a palate or suite, if you will, of these foraging, food nesting, and shelter sites for insects, in turn creating the same lack for amphibians and birds whose main food source or protein sources are insects at all stages in their lives. A healthy and regenerating forest creates all of this and more. Today we are hoping that you will start thinking and seeing these pretty landscapes as rich habitats. Thank you. Laura? Hello, I'm Laura Matei. I'm the Director of Stewardship with Sudbury Valley Trustees. And Sudbury Valley Trustees is a nonprofit land trust that works in 36 towns west of Boston, including Ashland and Framingham. And we have been in um, operation since 1953. And we protect lands, help communities protect lands. Uh, and we, we uh, also steward those lands and work to um, educate folks about uh, conservation lands as well. And um, I always like to say that we own a small key into the Ashland Town Forest. We only own 53 acres here, and the town of Ashland has this wonderful, spectacular resource of over 600 acres of beautiful forests. And in the last several years, we've been taking a look, a closer look at our forests in our region to see what's really happening out there and how, what do we need to do to take care of them. I think many of us might have thought that, um, as I used to when I was much younger, you know, nature will take care of itself. And what we're finding, though, especially in our heavily dominated human landscapes, is that there's a lot of stresses on those conserved lands that we have, and we really need to look at how they're functioning, what are the wildlife and what's happening with the wildlife and plants. Um, and as we've done that, we have come to terms with the fact that actually, in quite a few instances, we're needing to do some more active management. So what we're doing here today is sharing with you some information about this forest 
uh, about some of the concepts in management, and we're hoping to have a nice conversation with you after our two presenters. And our first presenter is Jeff Ritterson. Jeff has been working with at Mass Audubon on the Foresters for the Birds program. Jeff. Thanks, Lark. Um, is this good mic position here? Everyone can hear me? Great. Um, a lot to cover. I'll jump right into it. Um, I'll give briefly just some general background information about benefits of forest, uh, different values of forest, and then chat about uh, bird habitats and, and introduce the foresters for the birds program. Uh, Massachusetts is the eighth most forested state in the Union. Uh, we're also the third most densely populated, so we have a lot of people living within and among our forests. These forests provide a wide range of ecosystem goods and services. Uh, our forests influence water quality, water quantity, uh, and air quality, provide flood and erosion control, carbon sequestration, which of course has climate change implications. Um, they provide public health benefits, recreational opportunities forest products such as timber, uh, and of course wildlife habitat. To put that into economic terms, uh, our forests provide estimated uh, over $3.8 billion a year in free ecosystem services. For every dollar invested in land conservation, that's a $4 return on investments in terms of these services. At the same time, our forest um, are facing a lot of challenges moving into the future. In parts of the state, we see high rates of, of development and fragmentation of our forests. Uh, we have invasive plants that are displacing native species, disrupting ecosystem processes. Uh, high densities of deer in parts of the state, which you'll hear about uh, from our next presenter. Uh, invasive insects and disease and, and good old climate change um, is, is threatening our forests as well. Uh, there are several actions put forward by the conservation community to help to overcome some of these challenges. Uh, the first one being keeping your forest as forest. Sounds basic, but um, simply put, without forest, you're not going to have any of those ecosystem uh, services I just, just talked about. Uh, another broad action would be to reduce as many of these stressors as possible. Uh, that might include controlling deer or managing your invasive plant populations. And a third recommendation would be to increase the, the resiliency or responsiveness of your ecosystems. So a resilient ecosystem would be one that could withstand some sort of stressor and then return back to normal uh, at some sort of functional state in a relatively short amount of time. So with forests, that might be um, having a diversity of tree species, ages uh, within the forest, ages of forest. Uh, sort of like putting your eggs in, in more than one basket in the face of an unknown future. These are actions that can help overcome some of these stressors, and that includes uh, managing for wildlife, uh, including birds. Massachusetts, uh, the soils and the climate are great for growing forests throughout the state. Most of the state, if land isn't developed or maintained as agriculture, it's going to be forested. Uh, after some sort of disturbance to the canopy, natural or otherwise, the forest will begin to regenerate. Could begin as, as grasses and perennial wildflowers, moving to shrubs and saplings, and eventually maturing uh, to become a full-blown forest as, as many people would traditionally define it. Over this time period, you're seeing um, an increase in canopy height, how tall the forest is, an increase in canopy cover, how closed in it is. You're also seeing a decrease in the amount of sunlight reaching the forest floor. And at least initially, you, you're seeing an increase in the, the density down low of shrubs and saplings. Those are increasing until the canopy begins to close in, shading out the understory. Uh, and then the shrubs will again, will again flourish once there's some sort of disturbance to the canopy, again letting the sunlight down to the forest floor. All these things are, of course, interrelated. Um, and help to determine what, what bird species will be using the forest, and oftentimes uh, for what period of time. 
it's difficult to neatly categorize each species into a group, but for the sake of, of simplicity, we'll say that there are those birds that breed within young, regenerating forests and other early successional habitat types, uh, and those that breed within older, more closed canopy forests. Those breeding uh, in young forests are, are categorically in decline. Uh, one study identified 41 species in the Northeast, uh, three quarters of which are, are in decline or in, or in need of conservation attention. I'll point out that this is, um, the young forest is a, an ephemeral type of habitat, that is it's short lived. After about 15 or 20 years of, of regeneration, uh, it has matured beyond the point that's suitable for these birds. And the, the decline of these species is largely, largely attributed to habitat quantity or, or loss of habitat. Since 1950, Massachusetts has lost uh, over 90% of this habitat type. This is a trend seen throughout the region, uh, with the exception being Maine. In Maine, they have these large uh, industrial forests that are managed uh, solely for timber products. So they're regularly cut down, and the forest begins to regenerate, providing this habitat. Uh, the young forest habitat is dependent on, again, some sort of disturbance to the canopy. Historical sources of disturbance included beavers, beaver activity, not just chewing down trees, but building a dam, flooding out portions of a forest, thus killing the trees. Once that's abandoned, uh, it creates a beaver meadow, it's called. So, again, the forest is regenerating, providing that habitat. Fire has historically been an important source of disturbance, uh, particularly in the southeast of the state, where you have the more pitch pine oak dominated ecosystems, um, and storm damage has been important. We now, of course, are suppressing beaver activity. Uh, we are suppressing fires, uh, often on, or most often on, on private lands. And our more middle-aged forests are less susceptible to storm damage. So current sources of, of this habitat include um, Utility rights of ways, power line rights of ways that are managed specifically as as a shrubland or young forest. Um, wildlife management areas that are again managed for this habitat type, uh, and a th and a third source would be through through forestry activities. In fact, forestry has has been shown to be a relatively effective uh, and economically viable way of, of creating young forest habitat. Currently, our forest uh, Massachusetts forests are at about five percent young forest conditions, uh, where there's a, a general goal to have our forest, about 10 to 15 percent of them being in a, in a young forest condition. So we're looking to increase this habitat type. Uh, so just a little, little case study here, the chestnut-sided warbler. Um, looking at breeding bird atlas data, which shows, oh, right here. That shows uh, a change in the distribution or the breeding footprint of this bird over a 30 year period. Everywhere we are seeing a downward pointing red arrow is where we've lost this bird as a breeder in that part of the state. Uh, breeding bird survey data on the bottom left, um, that's showing abundance, how many of these birds there are. And you can see a pretty sharp decline uh, state in statewide abundance of the chestnut sided warbler. Uh, a spe the species likes about five to 15 year old hardwood forest, a dense layer of shrubs and saplings down low, and a canopy that's been reduced to under 30% closure. So these are pretty specific metrics that can be managed for uh, and created, for example, by a, by a forester. Uh, it may look something like this, it can be a bit startling to the untrained eye. I thought this was beautiful. Um, <laughs> A 20-acre cut in, in Peru, Massachusetts, about, oh, probably less than a year old and full of singing uh, white-throated sparrows that were, that were breeding there. This is a 10-acre cut in Lemonster, about, about three years old or so, three or four years old. You can see it's regenerating, full of singing prairie warblers. Uh, this is a cut in somewhere in Massachusetts. I forget exactly where, but... Um, <laughs> About eight or nine years old, you can see it's regenerating, still providing habitat for these birds, but eventually becoming uh, a closed canopy forest. 
uh, which provide habitat for a different suite of birds. This group uh, is faring a bit better than our, than our young forest, early successional bird species. There are those that are showing sharp declines, such as the wood thrush. Uh, otherwise, they're, they're relatively stable uh, and somewhat common, but we'd like to keep them that way. We'd like to keep our common birds common. One way to do that is to uh, provide high quality breeding habitat. When we talk about high quality breeding habitat, we're often chatting about a complex vertical structure, <coughs> layers within the forest. So we like to see uh, some leaf litter and organic material down low where birds like a, uh, an oven bird will nest. We like to see areas of a developed understory, zero to five feet high. Uh, where species like black or blue warbler will nest. Above that, areas of a developed midstory, say five to 30 feet high, where wood thrush will nest, many other species. Uh, all this is under a relatively tall uh, enclosed canopy up high, where up high birds like scarlet tanager will nest. Other features of high quality habitat would include snags, dead standing trees that are uh, decomposing, providing insects and other, other arthropods for birds to feed upon. Uh, cavity trees are important where species like woodpeckers, uh, some owls, titmice, chickadees uh, will nest. Having coarse woody debris, these big logs and other, other debris on the ground, providing that structural complexity, uh, also decomposing, providing forage for the birds, and some gaps in the canopy, letting that sunlight down to get the regeneration going. These are all features that are really common or, or characteristic of old growth forests, uh, which we have very few of in the state. This is simplifying it, but that's largely because at one point all of our land was cleared for agricultural purposes, uh, regenerated, most of it was cleared again for, for other markets. Um, that left us with a forest that all sort of grew back at the same time. So it's all about the same age. It grew back with a different species composition of trees, different, uh, different forest processes going on, leaving a relatively uncomplicated structure through a lot of our forests. So we have a lot of middle-aged forests, not a lot of young forests, not a lot of old-growth forests or forests with these complex structural features. Uh, another little case study here looking at the wood thrush breeding bird atlas. That one uh, showing relatively st stable throughout the state. Uh, we've lost this bird in maybe parts of the southeast as a breeder. Uh, but this is why we look at, at two sources of information. The other chart there, the breeding bird survey data showing abundance, a really sharp decline of this species throughout the state. So while it can be still found broadly across the state, uh, in fewer numbers. Uh, Jeff, yes, excuse me, what's the year span on that graph? Down here, it's, um, started in 1966 through, it looks like about 2012 that goes to. Um, this is a species that likes a tall canopy, diversity of hardwood trees, uh, and some understory and midstory to nest in and forage in. Again, conditions that can be, can be uh, accommodated for through, through sustainable forestry practices. Uh, so with all this in mind, uh, Mass Audubon partnered with the Department of Conservation and Recreation, the Mass Woodlands Institute, to bring the Foresters for the Birds program to Massachusetts. Uh, it originated in Vermont, and various states throughout the region have been, have been adopting it and, and tweaking it to fit the needs of their own state. The way it works in Massachusetts is that we train uh, private consulting foresters, those that work directly with landowners, and I sort of think of them being as, as architects in the woods, we train them to evaluate the existing bird habitat on our property and then make any sort of recommendations uh, for improvements. It could be doing nothing if appropriate. It could be creating some young forests. It could be uh, trying to accomplish some of that structural complexity in our older closed canopy forests. Um, getting this work done on, on private lands is important because some 65% of our, our forests are privately owned. So if we are to scale up our conservation efforts uh, to a meaningful level, it's important to, to engage with these private landowners. Uh, more and more frequently, we are working with uh, land trusts as well as municipalities, uh, such as Ashland. 
Uh, we did, I did help do one of these bird plans here uh, with your con a consulting forester. Um, I don't have a ton of time to really get into the details right now, but uh, just to put this into context, looking at the Ashland Town Forest shown in the yellow outline, um, it's a really large patch of forest, which is great in this landscape that's really human dominated. And within that red circle, which is 2,500 acres or about the radius of a mile, uh, you have 57% 50, upland mature closed canopy forest is, is probably a better term, uh, which is providing a great starting point to manage for birds and, and other wildlife. Uh, you have 0% young forest, so an opportunity to perhaps appropriate to create some of that. Uh, Town Forest does feature a power line right away. This is a picture I took there uh, maybe two years ago now. You can see uh, relatively recently mowed and not providing that, that woody, dense vegetation down low for some of these young forest birds that can use this habitat type. So it's an opportunity to maybe manage that in a different way or to, to build young forest off of to make it a larger area avoid disrupting some of those interior forests. <clears throat> uh, so it could look something like this. And then uh, just quickly a little anecdote here. I took this picture in the Ashland Town Forest at one spot facing one direction, pretty devoid understory. Uh, and on the other side, uh, you can see there's an understory there and there was a black throated blue warbler singing in that, in that patch of woods. Uh, I believe this is during migration so it may have just been passing through, but definitely keying in on that, on that structure down low. Um, I'm essentially out of time. I'll leave it there. I'll be around. There's my contact info. Thanks. Uh, up next, we have David Stainbrook with Mass Wildlife chatting about deer. Okay, hey everyone. Um, my name is David Stainbrook. I'm with uh, Division of Fisheries and Wildlife. Um, I'm the Deer and Moose Project Leader. And so um, basically our agency has a pretty big um, task. We are responsible for managing all wildlife, all fish, all plants, all insects, you name it. Um, and it runs from everything from the very common species like turkey and deer that require um, hunting as a tool to manage their populations and keep them stable to things that are endangered and threatened where we have to practice extreme preservation and conservation. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is white-tailed deer and um, essentially their impacts um, on that whole food web and the habitat when their deer numbers get a little bit too high. Um, as far as how far deer will go, essentially deer will, are pretty much born. Um, once they're born in an area, they'll stay in that area unless they're a male. When they're a year and a half old, about 75% of them will disperse to find a new home range that helps with keeping um, from breeding their own mothers and, and sisters. Um, and then once they establish a home range, they're, they're staying put. And so I say this because when we're talking about deer in an area, um, when deer are pressured through hunting or, what, or if, there's, if they've depleted the resources in an area, they don't just simply move to a new area. They don't... Um, go five miles elsewhere where there's better food. They're kind of creatures of habit. They stay where they were born. Um, and so what we tend to find is on the landscape, you have these very patchy, um, patchy distribution of deer. And so you can go into one forest and see deer everywhere and go a half a mile down the road and you hardly see any deer. Um, and the same thing goes with impacts to the habitat. Um, so as, as Jeff mentioned in one of those pictures, the, the understory in, in Ashland State Park there was pretty devoid of, of regenerating forest. And then elsewhere, there, there was plenty of regenerating forest. And so that's the kind of patchiness that you can see. Um, and it's because of the way the deer distribute on the landscape. And so here is a, an example of every one of these little yellow dots is a GPS location taken on a deer. This is part of my graduate work um, when I was in Pennsylvania. Um, and what you can see is there's, there's definitely the deer spent a lot of time here. It didn't spend much time over here, even though that's right next door. You know, so there's definitely this selection for certain areas, and a lot of that has to do with um, 
the geographic features of that of the habitat as far as can they get out of wind and cover you know from the elements and then food as well and keep in mind there's probably other deer that are using this area other deer using this area but this is just to demonstrate that patchiness and so you can imagine if they're eating in the forest here you would imagine you would see heavier impacts where there's more deer using this area less impacts where there's tend to be less impacts near roads and trails and where people are all right so their home range is about one to three square miles if you remember in Jeff's presentation, he showed that red circle. He said that was about a, a mile. Um, think of that as if that were one square mile. Um, we would want to see about 15 deer in that whole circle. And so just to put it into perspective, that's the kind of balance we need. Um, and their home range is one to three square miles. Breeding season is mid-November. Um, pretty much get about 100% breeding, you know, high 90s is percent for females that are successful in breeding if they're reproductive age and then every one of those um, females will give birth to anywhere between one and three fawns um, the average is about two and what we know from um, from some research on uh, predation is about half of those fawns will make it every year regardless of what's going on as long as there's predators and, and um, vehicles on the roads and and everything roughly about half of those fawns will survive and even if only half of them survive, it's still enough to allow that population to continue to grow. Um, so how do we manage deer in Massachusetts, but also across the entire country? We manage deer populations through regulated hunting. And so every hunter that buys a hunting license, that money goes into all the money that's used for all wildlife conservation, including threatened and endangered species. Um, but it also goes into allowing them to use a resource like uh, hunting deer. And every one of them has to take a hunter education class that goes through the safety. Um, with their hunting license, they get two tags to use for antler deer. And because deer are polygamous, if you take a male out of the population, it does nothing for population control because another male will just simply breed those females. Um, and so if you really want to make an impact on the population, you have to remove a female. And in order to remove a female, you have to have an antlerless deer permit. And so we give out a certain number of these antlerless deer permits throughout the state um, and there's also the different seasons so we have a youth season that's one day an archery season that's six weeks a shotgun season that's two weeks and a muzzleloader season that's about three weeks it runs to the end of the to the year um, as far as towns that are um, I'll get into this later but some of the towns that have restrictive bylaws that don't allow firearms bow only in those towns um, you can use a bow methods during uh, all of these seasons um, one thing I want to mention is we are having a public hearing on April 10th at 7 p.m. in our Westboro headquarters. Um, it's, it's involving a proposed archery extension for zones 10 through 14. That's in our eastern part of the state. An additional two weeks added to the, the beginning of the season. Um, and so it will only be for this area of the state. And essentially it's to allow additional opportunity for those archery hunters and, and perhaps maybe we'll be able to take enough, you know, some more deer um, out of the population in this part of the state to help us reduce deer numbers. Um, that early part of the season happens to be a time where deer are a lot more patternable, so you could actually have more of an impact than if it were in another time of the year. All right, so I, I talked about the antlerless deer permits. That's to take those females. That's important. In this part of the state, we don't give out a lot of permits because we already have deer numbers right where we want them to be because there's enough hunting access that we actually don't give out very many permits, um, even though hunters would love a lot more of the of these antlers permits. And then in the eastern part, we give out a lot more. Um, everybody that, every single hunter that takes a deer must report it, and so we can track harvest through time. This is what we've had since 1966 to 2017. We've had a record harvest this past year. This is a combination of um, the increasing deer numbers in our eastern part of the state with the continued harvest in our central and western part of the state. It's kind of leading us into this. Um, when you break it down by region of the state, so the same exact, um, so this is from 1985 until 2017, the, the blue line is our zones one through nine. This is basically everything west of 495. And you can see that our harvest is, is kind of, during the early 90s, we gave out a lot more doe permits in some of those zones to kind of get them back into right where we want them to be um, as far as deer numbers. But from that whole time, it's been pretty stable. And then in the eastern zones, zones 10 through 14, You've seen this steady increase in our harvest um, 
all the way up until here. And so you combine those two, you can see why there's a record harvest. And so this is kind of an artifact of that increasing deer density in these eastern, um, eastern zones. And then additionally, we collect biological information from um, deer during the first week of our shotgun season. Um, and the data that we collect from the deer is what drives a lot of the decision making in this science-driven process. And so we look at health indices, we look at body weights, we look at their age um, from their teeth, and so we use the age data to inform us about what's going on with their population, um, age structure and everything. All right, so what we have is basically everything west of 495, um, deer numbers are right where we want them to be. And we have this goal, it's a verbal goal, and that goal is to keep deer numbers at a level that's below where we would see some major impacts to the forest. And this is important because we want to make sure that we're not putting a, you know, the other wildlife that we're responsible for managing as detriment because of increasing deer numbers or keeping deer numbers too high than they should be. And so we want to keep them in that nice balance where they're not causing those major impacts to the forest. Um, and so we have a kind of a, a numeric benchmark that we'd like to keep deer numbers within the 6 to 18 deer per square mile of forest range. Um, so keep in mind with that circle, a square mile, we're talking six to 18 deer in that whole circle. Um, imagine if you're walking through that circle, if you guys know that property, um, you could probably see 10 deer in one little spot. You know, so you can kind of see what we're talking about here. <laughs> um, and then in this part of the state, our deer numbers are much higher than we'd like them to be. And the number one reason is it comes down to access. And access means areas that are open to hunting. We have enough access in this part of the state that we can remove deer through hunting. In this part of the state, we have some spots where we have a little bit more access, like up here and down here, where the deer numbers are a little bit more balanced where we'd like them to be, where there's enough hunting access. But for the most part, it comes down to that. All right, so why do we care? What happens if deer numbers get too high? Um, you know, and, and I think this is important here that as far as the forest for the birds, the forest is going to be impacted. If the forest is impacted, it's going to impact insect numbers, bird numbers, everything. Um, bird nesting success. If there's not enough cover for bird nests to succeed, um, it's important. And so that's why we really want to keep our deer numbers below that level. Certainly it's going to make it some un hunters unhappy. I think a lot of hunters would love to see really high deer numbers because it's easier to get deer, but um, we have to keep it all in balance. And additionally, as deer numbers increase, there's public safety risk, number one being um, vehicle collisions, but also you know, tick-borne illness, um, property damage. And I think for our agency, we value all wildlife species, all native species. And when certain species become overabundant, they start to be devalued. And people f look at them as a pest, and they want someone to come to just take it away. Uh, they don't want it. Uh, we've seen this now with beavers. Um, we see it with a lot of other wildlife Deer are becoming the new pest. Um, and so why do we have issues in suburban deer landscape, or suburban landscapes in those eastern parts of the state? Um, because there's plenty of food. I think the idea that if you have this big block of forest and you um, put 200 houses in and you, and you cut forest and put all these houses in, you've removed forest, and so you've made it worse for wildlife, when in fact, actually, you've probably made it better for most wildlife because you've created edge habitat around every one of those houses and every one of those yards. And that structure um, is, is great for most wildlife, especially deer. Um, protection from hunting, I'll get into that. Um, basically what we know is because we've, as humans, have removed the major predators of deer, historical predators of deer, like the mountain lion and, and wolves and also us as a human, you know, historically we were removing deer year round um, for food, and uh, now it's limited to just a, a f you know, couple weeks in the in the fall, um, or 65 days in the fall, and only where hunters are able to get in. So what we know is now in our current situation, we do still have predators of deer, but mostly they take fawns. Um, we take some deer off the roads with with vehicles, and you know, some die, some deer will die naturally, but. When it's all added up, it's not enough to kind of keep those deer numbers from growing. And so we, what we see is in communities where there's not much hunting access, the deer numbers are growing each year, getting higher and higher. In the areas where we have adequate hunting access um, and we're taking enough deer, we're able to kind of keep those deer numbers from growing. And the hunting access 
Um, basically, it comes down to uh, the biggest one is the discharge setbacks. And so there's a state law that says within 150 feet of any hard surface public highway, you cannot hunt. Um, no exceptions. And then within 500 feet of an occupied dwelling, essentially you cannot hunt um, unless you get permission from those, from those homeowners. Very hard to get permission from a lot of these situations. So if you have a forest and there's 20 houses that are all around it, um, and there's nowhere that's 500 feet from those houses to hunt that, but it's loaded with deer, you didn't need to get permission from all 20 houses to be able to hunt that property. And you wouldn't have to get permission to say, you know, let me hunt with, within, you know, zero feet of your house. You could say, would you be comfortable with me hunting within 200 feet of your house? And get that permission from all 20 homeowners. And maybe you'd be able to, to have a, a section in the middle that you could take deer. But once it comes down to, does this actually happen? It doesn't. You know, it's really hard to get that permission. Usually you can get some people to say yes, most people say no. Is that the same for firearms and bows? Yes. In, in a lot of states, for bows, it's sometimes they don't even have a discharge setback in some states. Um, New York was exactly the same as us, and I think within the last five years, they reduced, for archery, they reduced it to 150 feet. Um, if that were to happen in Massachusetts, it'd be incredibly beneficial. We'd actually be able to have more access to remove deer. But it's the same. 500 feet is a really long distance for archery, yeah. really long distance, so. Um, and then additionally, towns will put in place bylaws that make it you know, more restrictive um, for hunting, and a lot of times those bylaws are put in place with, you know, it, hunting was not even on the table when they were talking about these. It was mostly for discharge of, of handguns or, or whatnot. Um, but a lot of times, it's not written in there that it's an exemption for hunting, and so therefore you can't use guns in the town or you have to get written permission all right, so this is kind of what it looks like in the state with towns that have some sort of a bylaw. Um, and a lot of these red ones are no discharge of firearms. The yellow ones are ones that require written permission. Um, green is a combination of the two. But you can see most of those bylaws tend to be right in this section of um, the state. And that's right where we tend to have a lot of deer issues. And so the town of Ashland is one of these. It's the red one right here. Um, your bylaw says no person shall fire or discharge any bow or arrow within the limits um, of the town um, or on private property except with the written consent of the landowner legal document thereof. So you can archery hunt in the town of Ashland, but you need to get landowner permission on private property. And if you are on public property, you need to get permission from the Board of Selectmen for archery hunting. And then no person shall discharge any rifle, shotgun, or handgun um, within the limits of town except on a range. Um, for such purposes, chief of police. So basically, that means you can't use a dis you can't use a, a a gun for any hunting in the town. No exception. Um, and so what that means is, for hunting, you're only able to use bows and arrows in the town. And so, yes, you can hunt, you can remove deer, um, but archery methods are um, the, the difference between them and and firearms is that. Um, so say you're a hunter in a, in a tree stand and a, a, you have five days to hunt. On those five days, two of the times you see deer, one time you see them at 80 yards. Um, with a shotgun, that's an easy shot. With a bow, you, you don't even think about it. You, you are within 20 yards is about as far as you can shoot. Um, and so you have to pass on those deer. You see them a second time, they're, they're at 40 yards. A shotgun, that's easy shot. Again, with a bow... Most bow hunters will not take that shot. That's too far. Uh, you know, 30 yards is about as far as most will go. And so you can see how if guns were allowed, those deer would have been removed from that, um, from that area. With archery methods, you have to keep hunting until those deer end up getting closer to you, or you have to keep moving your, your tree stand until you get closer to them, um, essentially. And so it just means, what it means is you need more time to be able to remove those deer. You can still remove them, you just need more time. And so it comes down to, can you, I'll get to a graph at the, at the end, but. All right, the next part of this is that discharge setback that I said, about 500 feet. This is what it looks like when you map it across the state, looking at all of the forests in each town, and then you take out all of the forests that's locked up in that setback. And the, so the darker the red, the more 
of that forest and the town is locked up in discharge setbacks. And if you didn't know what I just told you and you just saw this map and you said, what does this mean? You could almost say the darker the red, the more deer there are. That's how, that's how direct this, this correlation is. It comes down to access. Where we have plenty of hunting access here, our deer numbers are very well balanced, even here. Some sections of nine, right around here, we tend to have issues with high deer numbers, right in these areas with red. Um, in zone 10, in the eastern mass, this tends to be areas where we have a lot of high deer numbers, and then right in here, we have a lot of high deer numbers. Down here, not so much. You know, it comes down to that. It's, it's that simple. All right, so Ashland is this town right here. And um, here's a, a, a zoomed-in version of, of what you have. So you do have some Ashland Town Forest is outside discharge setbacks. Here's outside, here's outside, here, here, Hopkins State Park. So you do have some areas outside of discharge setbacks, some little, tiny little spots here. Um, again, you could, if you wanted to hunt this little property and you could get the homeowner's permission, you could potentially, you know, find some of these little spots and hunt them. Um, but here's what it comes down to. The percent of forest not in setback, 26%. So that means that if everything was open in the entire town, everything was open to hunting, you could only manage deer on 26% of the town. And so if you think that you're going to be able to solve deer issues when you can only manage them on 26% of the area, that's, that's a tall task. Um, but what we know is it's not even 26%. It's even l lower than that once you factor in whether places are open hunting or not. Um, so basically, I would say Ashland has over three-quarters of the, of the deer habitat in the town is close to hunting easily. Um, so you don't have a lot of room to work with. So I would say you have to do as much as you can with what you have. Um, we tend to see in towns where you have more than half the, of the forest is closed to hunting, um, you tend to have deer issues where over, you know, over half the, the area is, is open hunting, you tend to have the ability to manage them. Um, and so, yeah. So we, um, <clears throat> several of us as homeowners in, the Sudbury Valley uh, trustee land got together and got, you know, government approval for, for bow hunting on that property the last two years. This last year, um, which was the highest take you showed in the state, uh, our, our one hunter uh, didn't, got nothing bow hunting. Uh, and Sort of his feedback is since he has to hunt in such a tight circle area, you know, he sees all the, the you talked about the deer sort of stay in an area, but would you say that when they see that pressure, they're going to go someplace else? Yeah, so that comes down to um, if you do have deer on a, on a property and they, they experience pressure from hunting, um, will they move? So some of the studies that looked at that, only about 25% of the time do deer move off of a property far enough away um, that they'll escape the hunting pressure. So not many do, uh, but typically what they do is they end up, they'll end up being right back there um, a couple days later. Yeah. And usually the hunting pressure is not from archery, it's from being shot at with a gun. That's typically what, you know, in our, in our field, what a hunting pressure would be, or Which one of not the case here. Yeah. yeah, so I don't think, deer know where they're not going to be pressured, and even within, you know, a quarter of a mile, they know where they can get away from right. people. And, and the way that they, they will treat somebody walking on a trail with a dog, um, or without a dog, when they see them every day, to a hunter walking off the trail into some of these thick areas is completely different. Mm -hmm. They react, they know difference after a few times so when I'm going through this I don't want to try to make this sound like you have no hope here because you do you can have localized impacts so if, you know if this were all open you could have you could reduce deer numbers within this area easily you're probably not going to do much other ways but um, I'll get into an example of that all right so here's your harvest for the town of Ashland and something unique happened in the last two years your harvest went way up um, and what I like to do is, is take this 
the total number of deer and divide it by the, the habitat in the town to give us some idea of, so we can compare town to town. Because if you divide it by the area, then you can compare one town to another town regardless of size. Um, what we see is what you've averaged over the, the past 10 years or so is about two deer per square mile removed. Um, that number is, is a pretty low number for knowing that the deer numbers are probably on the higher side. Um, but it's, it's, it's a good number. Um, and then it jumped up to removing about four deer per square mile, which is really good. That's about what we average in all of zone 10. And so if you can sustain this kind of a number, I think that would be um, helpful. And so I don't know, did anything change drastically in the last two years with access? Where? No, I was going to ask, where are people taking deer nationally? So that was kind of my, when I saw this. It's only bow hunting, right? Correct, yeah. Yeah. How, you know, that's not so how can, how can that be true? So if we go back to here, there's little pockets all through here that you're not really able to see real well. That if any of that's private land, people could be in there hunting. So it's, it's been going on all this time. And so there's certainly places. And also keep in mind, if, if, if you live out here, um, here and, and, and you own this house, you can give yourself permission to hunt that. You can hunt right behind your house, you know. So there's plenty of places to hunt in the town, and these these little tiny pockets are probably the best thing you can do. I would rather have hunters in that pocket, that pocket, that pocket, that pocket, than those same four hunters in one little spot, because they have a higher reach to remove deer at a larger scale with that. Um, yes, question. Uh, when they come into the check stations, or if they, you can report online, can you? Yeah, archery season, you can report them online. First week of shotgun, they have to go to a check station, and then the rest they can do online. They, the they give the town. That's it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't think... Because I can guarantee you that there are a lot of people hunting on properties that they don't have permission in this town. Yeah, I'm sure that's happening in a lot of these towns. Yeah. Uh, the town yeah, and so what I would recommend is if you do happen to come across someone that's hunting in a place where you know they should not be, call the environmental police, not your local police, not the state police, the environmental police. Let them know. Um, if it does happen to be town property, then the local police will probably be the ones enforcing trespass. But um, Because what tends to happen is in towns where there's illegal hunting going on like that, you know, those hunters tend to be, not be the, the best representatives of the hunting community. Um, and they're usually the ones that give the bad name to these types of programs when we try to get areas open to hunting and, and there's stories that come up about um, a bad experience with a hunter. It's usually the ones that are sneaking into the properties. But So if you replace those hunters with ones that you permit, a lot of times what happens in some of these towns is once they let in permitted hunters that they know um, that have gone through some sort of a process, um, those hunters will actually kind of enforce the, the trespass of those properties and keep some of those other people out, which is good. Yes? Just a follow-up question. Can you go to that other screen for a second that shows that, just to follow up what you said, if these people are hunting in places they're not supposed to, you're saying they're still calling and registering the deer having been shot and killed in Ashland? Does mm -hmm. that account for that 28 number? So I'm just trying to follow this. They're hunting where they're not supposed to, but they're still calling and documenting the kill? Well, they might be hunting where they're completely allowed to be With and arson. completely legal. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You don't know what percentage of those are? That's not a question asked. Um, I imagine all these would be with archery methods, yeah. Is that asked? Uh, yes. Yep. Is that reporting information public record? Uh, it is, yeah. Yep. And so law enforcement has access to all that as well. And so they would be looking through um, all that information. All right, so moving on. I didn't think we'd spend as much time on that. Um, what can be done as a town? I, I would say the biggest thing you can do is um, a lot of times the towns don't come to me or our agency for help until it's almost too late where their deer numbers are just so high that they don't really have many options left. My biggest one, my biggest thing would be for towns that come to us for help before you have a problem so we can be
proactive in coming up with a way to, to prevent the deer numbers from getting high. It's going to be a lot easier to deal with the issue when the deer numbers are low or medium rather than when they're already way too high. Um, archery, for instance, um, you have a much better chance of keeping those deer numbers at a, where you want them if you start early with archery than if you try to throw archery at it um, when they're already too high. How many deer do you estimate are in the town for? Um, I, I'll kind of get to that a little bit later. Can you repeat the question, David, because I can't hear for repeat the recording. That yeah. question? Sure. Um, well, any more questions from the audience you take, you can repeat them. That would be helpful. Okay. So uh, that gentleman's question was, how many deer do we think there are in the Ashland Town Forest? Um, and I'll get to that in a, in a later slide. Uh, the other thing I would say is, before you start some sort of hunting program, start monitoring. Get baseline data. And so start asking for, um, look at forest health. What is the condition of your forest? Where would you like it to be? Um, monitor that over time. Get reports of, of deer damage, deer vehicle collisions from the town police. Get all that information. It helps us better understand what's going on. And then meetings like this. Um, regional scale, so each town is not dealing with this alone. Towns can work together to kind of deal with this at a larger scale. That's the best way to do it. Um, but it really comes down to hunting access is that major roadblock. And um, a lot of these roadblocks are put in place by the town and the public, and they can re be removed by the town and the public as well. One of the big things is, is property access. And so as a private landowner, if somebody does come to you and ask for permission to hunt on your property, um, you are protected under this landowner liability law, which is very strong in Massachusetts. And basically, you are protected if that hunter, or not even hunters, just if somebody's hiking on your property, or if they're bird watching on your property and they, they're injured, as long as you didn't charge them a fee to access your property, you are protected under anything that could happen to them. The exception being if you did something on purpose to try to hurt them. <laughs> and the other exception is <laughs> if you charged a fee. So if you, if you said, yeah, you can hunt on my property, but you got to give me 20 bucks, you know, now you're responsible. So, or as a town, if you said, we're going to have a town hunting program, um, each hunter has to pay a, a $30 administration fee to go through this process. That's a fee, you know. And so now you, as a town, you are protected under this li liability law, but if you charge a fee, now you're not. Is that what they do in Blue Hill, for example? Blue Hill is, is a state property, um, and there's also no fee charged. And uh, homeowners can allow people to hunt within 500 feet of their home. Again, I, I said, you know, if you're concerned about this, you could say, you can hunt within 300 feet of my home. You know, and that opens up a lot more property. My question on that is, what if they do that and they shoot you? Kind of lose the ability to go against them because they say, "Well, you said I could hunt them." I can guarantee you, you will not be shot by an arrow, <laughs> unless you are dressed as a deer. <laughs> um, and then, the bylaws that towns put in place. A lot of times, those those bylaws were put in place again to protect um, or to prevent people from discharging handguns or something in the in the town. Um, if once they realize that it impacts hunting, sometimes they can just make a slight change to say, with the exception of, you know, hunting in the town or something like that. All right, so back to this gentleman's question. How many deer are there in this property or how many deer are there in the town? It's near impossible for me or anyone in, in, to, to tell you how many deer there are. Um, you can't count them. It's not like you can do a census and have them return their forms in the mail. Um, and even if you were able to kind of do, put a, fly in a plane over a property and try to count them, you're only going to see about maybe half of them that are out there. Um, and they move, so you could double count them, you, or you could never count them. And so it becomes a really hard process. You, just, you can't just count them. And so we, that's actually what I went to grad school for was, um, you know, population dynamics or coming up with ways to uh, look at abundance of different wildlife species. And this is the challenge is that, some animals move, and um, like if we we're going to tell you how many trees there are in, in the forest, that's easy. They're not moving. We can count them. Um, we wouldn't count every single tree. We'd probably do a transect, count how many trees are on a transect, and extrapolate that out to a larger area. Well, 
with a sample. How, how, how do you know there's too many out there if you don't know how many are there? Exactly. So his question is how many, how do we know how many are too many? And so this is what we're going to go to next, <laughs> in my next slide here. Um, and so we do kind of come up with projections throughout the state by zone using the harvest data. There's some modeling we can do. Um, gives us some estimates. We can go out and do other types of surveys. We can we can actually walk transects and count pellet groups. You know, as they defecate, we know that the average deer defecates, you know, 25 times a day. Um, we know how many days there have been since the leaves fell. We can, you know, figure all this out in a, in a calculation and come up with some projection of of um, how many deer there are in the landscape. We can do those surveys. They take a lot of time. We can only do a few a year. We are trying to do those. Um, they can kind of help come up with some deer numbers. Um, but a even easier one is you look at the forest, you look at the plants, you look at the impacts. And that can tell you, it might not tell you that there's 24 deer per square mile or there's 37 deer per square mile or 52 deer per square mile, but it tells you that whatever those deer numbers are, it's too many for what this habitat can support. That's the easiest way to do it. So you walk out into the forest, you look at um, what's growing, and so we know that deer eat a lot of different, it's easier to, to say what they don't eat than what they do eat, um, but what we do know is that deer will pick the things that taste the best first, and then once those are gone, they'll start to eat the things that darn is tasty, and once those are gone, they'll eat starvation foods. Um, that happens as deer numbers get higher and higher, um, and so what we can do is take, for instance, um, red maple. Red maple is something that any deer will eat, whether there's one deer or there's 200 deer, if a red maple is there, they'll eat it. Take American beech. If that tree um, is a really good one to look at, if deer numbers are where they should be, they should never eat it. It should never be browsed. If you walk into a forest and you're seeing all the American beeches being browsed, that's an indicator that the deer numbers are too high. Like if, it, if you boil it down to the easiest way to look, that'd be the one thing I would say. Go into your forest, you see American beech being browsed. If so, your deer numbers are too high. Um, things like white pine is, is what I would consider a starvation food. Um, very high levels of tannins. It's not something that they would typically eat. So when I walk into a property and I see that a white pine has been browsed, that's bad. That's bad news. That means your deer numbers are really high. So that, that kind, does that answer your question? That's how we can tell that the deer numbers are too high. It might not give us, it might not, might not be able to tell you that there's exactly 34 deer on this property, um, but I don't think you need to know that there's 34 deer on the property. I think you need to know that whatever the deer numbers are, it's, it's too high. What about um, shrubs like rhododendron, mm -hmm. uh, Lakothawee, uh, yep. This this past two Holly, this past two years, they have been decimated. Exactly. So keep in mind, in the winter time, um, they're going to be eating twigs of hardwoods and shrubs, and then there's certain things that are evergreens that will have green vegetation, um, and there's different levels. So it's like um, uh, white cedar is something that is green; it's an evergreen. They they will eat that; they like it. Um, so even if you had low deer numbers in the winter time, you would expect them to eat that. Things like white pine or um, your rhododendron or your, your laurels, your mountain laurel. Um, rhododendrons and, and mountain laurels and, and sheep laurel, they all have uh, toxins in them that are poisonous for deer. And so if deer eat them and they eat enough of them, it's toxic. And we've had times where um, in, in places where deer have eaten so much rhododendron that they've died from it. And we've had to do necropsies on deer because of that. And, and so they can eat a little bit of it and be able to be okay, but if they eat too much of it, it can actually kill them. And so there's this balance. If they're starving, they'll eat a little bit of that kind of stuff. Holly is one of those ones that it's not toxic, but it's not um, as tasty. Um, but they're probably going to select some of these. So like white pine, for instance, they're never going to eat white pine in the summer. They're never going to eat it in, in the, you know, the fall. If they're going to eat it, it's going to be in, you know, February, March, when there's nothing else to eat. And, and so most of the times when we're going to a forest and we're looking at the impacts on the forest, we're looking at things they ate in February and March, browsed on in that time of the year, because that's when the food is the most scarce. Uh, yes? So you talked about uh, overpopulation control. 
hold of deer by harvesting, mm -hmm. by hunting. Are there other methods um, short of harvesting by hunting? Yeah, so there's a lot of other methods out there um, for lethally removing deer out of the population. Um, there's hunting. There's hiring a company to come do it instead of hunters. Um, there's non-lethal methods um, as far as taking deer, ca catching them and moving them somewhere else or trying to treat them with birth control or actually catching them and, and removing the reproductive organs. There's a lot of options out there, but what I've focused on are the ones that are, that are one, legal in Massachusetts, and two, um, are ones that are actually going to reduce the population. And so, in a nutshell, the, the um, contraceptive one, you can use it to treat deer, and for the most part, they are effective at reducing pregnancy rates. Um, in the sterilization, where you actually capture a deer and remove its reproductive organs, you can prevent that female from ever having offspring again. But if you have 200 deer per square mile or 100 deer per square mile and you want to get it down to 15, um, you can treat every female in that whole population and you're still going to have 200 deer per square mile. And until all those deer die, you're not going to get down to that low level that you'd like to have. And deer can live, you know, 10 to 15, upwards of 20 years in the wild. Um, typically, it's around 10 to 15. Um, but in that whole, meanwhile, there's other deer that are dispersing in. And so in a, an open landscape, so I'm talking about places like anywhere in Massachusetts um, where there's not a fence up preventing any deer from coming in or it's not an island, um, an open landscape where you have deer moving in and out, those options just aren't going to lead to a reduction in the deer numbers that you need. Um, and so that it's just not really worth talking about those. And they're incredibly expensive, you know, whereas the hunting is essentially free. Uh, if a town wants to allow hunting in the town, th those hunters have paid for a license that money goes to, you know, all wildlife and for them to use the resource. And then they can come in and, and take deer. It's free for the community to use that as an option. Whereas if you tried to use, you know, a company to come in, it would cost quite a bit of money. And it's also not a legal option in Massachusetts at this point. So does that kind of sum it up for you for the options? Um, I didn't include that in here because I only had 20 minutes to talk, but I definitely want past that. But, you know, these deer talks can easily go an hour if, if we get into all the different things. Um, yes? How do you ensure public safety in a place like a town forest? Public safety when you're using hunting? Yeah. Um, exa what exactly. What notifications so, are there, you know, for people to know if they're, you know, we use the forest every day. And a lot yeah. Of and, and so to give an example, um, where I live is in central Massachusetts in Rutland. The culture there is, is such that people know about hunting. They know when the hunting season starts. People know to be aware when they're in the woods in the, in the, in the fall. Yeah. Um, but towns like in the eastern part of the state, they are not familiar with that. And so this is completely new to them. And so that's where if a town is going to open up certain lands for, for hunting, um, the town really should do a good job of, of notifying the community, putting up signs where the, the places that are going to be open to hunting um, letting them know when the season dates are. Um, and as far as if there is a concern that, you know, there's just too many people hiking in this property and they just don't feel comfortable with the hunters um, there, a lot of times what towns have done is kind of work with the the property to say, say no hunting within 150 feet of any trail or these particular trails or something like that. And Realistically, no hunter would ever hunt on a hiking trail because the deer are not going to be on hiking trails in the daytime. In nighttime, they'll be all over them. Yeah, exactly. um, so in my mind, there's no issue. There shouldn't be any issues. Um, but certainly from the public perspective, there are concerns. And so there, there's a give and take and a balance that, um, that towns can do when they're developing some sort of a hunting um, program. And that I'm here to help with, with all those types of decisions. The, the thing is, the more restrictions you put in place, you know, the less area will be open, the less, the fewer deer you'll take, and so there's a, a trade-off. Can I give you a microphone? Sorry, I haven't been repeating the questions. Sure. Um, I had a question just in terms of the uh, ratio between the male to the female in given areas, and then also, do the females tend to roam more for food than the males? All right, so the sex ratio. Um, typically, it should be 50-50, right? Okay. That's how they're born. 
But what we tend to see is um, in communities where there's not a lot of hunting, uh, you tend to see that um, females actually have a higher survival rate than males. And so if you extrapolate that out to say 10 years, you're going to have more females on the landscape than males because males are actually have a larger home range. They move more. Um, and so your next question about um, do females move more than males? Actually, males mo move more than females, but it's not driven by food. It's driven by reproduction. And so they tend to have a larger home range um, so that they can increase their ability to breed with females, but not so huge. So ma females you know, tend to be anywhere from half a mile to two square miles home range. In a town like Ashland, I would say less than a square mile, you know, smaller, because they have everything they need. A male would tend to be a little bit larger of a home range you know, than that. Um, so maybe two or three square miles. And it expands in the, in the fall when they're breeding and then kind of shrinks back up for throughout the rest of the year. Right. We see them go back and forth behind our house. So you know, they're migrating from further in the forest over to Hopkinton or whatever. But as I recall, it mostly seems to be females. Yeah, and so in a community like Ashland, it wouldn't surprise me if you had way more females than males here. And um, they're probably not moving that far. They're probably just moving from one spot to another. Um, all right, so I just have a couple more uh, slides here. So for the town of Ashland, um, one of the things that we've been doing is, is looking at some forest health metrics. And so we have been able to go out to a, some of these properties and look at um, a ranking of forest. And so basically, the, um, there aren't any, any properties that we've surveyed in this area that are little to no impact. That would be a dark green. Um, these properties have to be a little bit better shaped, so these are between, um, they're just under moderately impacted between little and moderately. And Ashland State Park happened to be, and for the most part, uh, we didn't see a whole lot of major impacts there, but it was you know, close to moderately impacted there. Um, the Ashland Town Forest was much worse. That was much more heavily impacted. And then further up here, um, that's where we're actually seeing some browsing on, on white pine and things that we would not expect to see. Um, but down, down here, it wasn't as bad, down here. And then in these areas, it was a little bit more impacted. Um, so this kind of gives you a sense of, you know, you could easily see that deer numbers on this part of the town are much higher than down here. Um, down here, maybe they're a little bit higher. But this gives a sense of, of what you're dealing with. And then the last part was just to kind of go through a, another town that has gone through this. Um, and so I think that you can save a lot of time and headache if you just look at another town that's already been through all this. You know, instead of you guys reinventing the wheel in each town, um, learn from what another town has done, what's worked, what didn't work. Um, and so we'll kind of go through what the town of Weston did. And so you can see that the town of Weston is actually um, one of these dark maroon. So not much of their land is, op is uh, outside discharge setback. So they don't have a lot to work with. Um, but what they did have to work with was some town land. So here's town land, town land, town land, town land, town land, town land. A lot of this outside discharge setbacks was town land. So this is um, privately owned, but it's in a conservation restriction. And then this is um, state owned. And so most of, the, most of the area that would be open to hunting is all owned by the town. And so that town did a really good job of opening all that town land. And so all these areas that are highlighted here are all open to controlled hunt. And that's been in place... Um, they started out with just a few properties, and they've added new properties each year. Um, it's been about four or five years now. And um, so they did a pretty phenomenal job of doing what they could with what they had. And so if we were to kind of show you what this looks like as a deer reduction, um, this is all the forested green here, and the, the orange is what was open to hunting, and then this transparent overlay is kind of essentially... How far reaching is that hunting? How impactful is it further out? And this gives you a sense of um, if you were to go there today and look at the deer numbers in this area, um, it appears that the deer numbers there are a little bit lower than what they were five years ago. Um, if you go over here, no change. Um, and so they are doing archery only, and it's pretty uh, restrictive. And so it's, you know, they're not going to be reducing their deer numbers really quickly. Um, but they are doing, if they did nothing, their deer numbers would be much higher than what they are today. And so it's been, it's been um, very effective towards their goals. And this is kind of showing you 
Remember I showed the, the figure of Ashland and their harvest? Um, they were about here, and then they jumped up to here. The red is what they took through their controlled hunt. The blue is what was taken just from regular hunters hunting in, in, the, in the town. And so prior to the controlled hunt, they were taking about 1.5 deer per square mile. Remember, you guys were taking about two deer per square mile, um, and then it jumped up to four this past year. And now they're taking somewhere around five deer per square mile in the town. And this is saturated across the whole town. So if you're looking at just here, that's much more than five deer per square mile taken from right here. That could be something like eight to ten, and they could actually start to see some reduction in the deer numbers. You know, so this is kind of to put into perspective. And then this is kind of the last slide um, as far as what to expect. So uh, what we see with deer numbers, there's this kind of this growth rate in the population if you do nothing, anywhere from 2 to 8% growth. Um, if you do a very, very limited access, um, just archery, you'd be lucky to just kind of keep the deer numbers from growing, um, maybe drop them a little bit. And a lot of these situations in Eastern Mass might be in this, where you just don't have enough access to really do enough and you're stuck to archery only. But even if you could do this and keep them from growing, that's incredibly effective than where you would be in, you know, if you did nothing. Um, if you were able to increase access and you still stuck to archery, you might actually be able to start reducing them, but at, at kind of a slow rate. Um, if you're able to throw everything at it that we allow, you know, all the seasons, all the implements, um, and enough access, you could really drop them. And this is kind of what you would expect to see in like the Blue Hills hunt, um, which we've actually seen, you know, this reduction. And they've only been doing four days. If they did more than four days, it'd even be more dramatic. But so this is kind of, these are your options essentially. And so our, if, if you started out at 40 deer per square mile and you did nothing, you know, you'd be at 60 deer per square mile or, or so in, in 10 years. Um, hypothetically, so I guess that's that's the end. So if you want to take questions, I don't know how we're doing on time. Uh, may I just ask one one question? May I just ask one question? Yes, yes, yes. Um, I had heard that if I don't know if this is true, but if if there were no hunting and the population increases and increases, that the deer will possibly die of starvation or disease and and sort of horribly. Is that true? Yes, luckily um, we don't have those high of deer numbers in Massachusetts to get to that point yet, um, but certainly that happens. So, um, and it can be anywhere from, it depends on the, what the habitat can support. Like you could have 100 deer per square mile in a, in a poor habitat and they would starve to death. Um, or you could have 250 deer per square mile on a, on a more supportive habitat and they would be, you know, get to a point where they starve to death. So that number, we don't know, but Essentially what would happen is in those areas where we have had it in the northeast, um, with the exception of the further north climates where it's weather driven, but if it's driven by abundance, so say you go to New Jersey and you look at some of those examples where their deer numbers got too high, um, essentially they get really, really high, there's nothing for them to eat, and then they, you get starvation, you get a die off, and then the population drops a little bit. It doesn't drop way down to... It doesn't reset. It's not like it's hitting the reset button. Um, it goes down a little bit, and then in five to ten years, they, they're right back up, and then you get another starvation event, and it's kind of that cycle, and, it's, and I don't want to make it sound like that's a natural thing in any way, and that's sort of like a, you know, nature keeping things in control, because that's not natural. You know, in a, historically, you would have, you know, the whole complex predator interaction that would never allow it to happen. And unfortunately, in those situations, the forest suffers because of it. So does that kind of answer that one? Yes, thank you. Hi, guys. So um, I'm Laura Cazo. I'm one of the Terracor members from Mount Grace. And I'm going to help run the Q&A for this awesome program we have. So just a couple things to go over. We have um, about seven questions. And each question um, will be about roughly seven minutes, just so we keep the time going. Um, if you have more questions, please raise your hand, let us know, and we'll bring the mic over to you so everybody can hear and it's nice and clear for the cameras. Um, so I guess we'll begin. Yep. 
So does anyone have any additional questions to be begin? Oh, okay. Okay. Tempe, do you have the um, the landowner goals? So on your sheets, your handouts, there are um, the highlights of the landowner goals. So the same forester, so when we did our forest stewardship plan, Town Forest Committee did ours, SVT did theirs, um, saves a little bit on the forester and it gets it all done at the same time. We also um, were lucky enough to get um, the first two Eastern Bird Habitat assessments, um, and Jeff Rudderson, our speaker, came and did them. And then David Stainbrook came and um, did a couple of deer surveys. One was trying to actually find the deer and count them physically, and then they were changing over to the other um, piece that he talked about, which is going out and doing a vegetation surveys. And for that one, I was lucky enough to have some time free that day, and I went out with them, and they had a couple of their um, expert biologists with them and they could show us um, what was not in the forest and what was there and why certain things were in certain places that deer would normally eat. Um, so that was pretty interesting. Um, so that's why you have all those assessments. If people are interested in uh, reading them and, and seeing that in more detail, it's on the Ashland Town Forest pages and it's all the related documents. Just keep poking around till you find them. Um, so I'm looking through my stuff here, sorry. We, so there's a highlights of the forest stewardship plan, uh, and then we have a species list of associated creatures that go with the suites of birds. So one of your, your color habitats is all the, the various birds you'll find, and we have two major habitats in our town forest, which is a maple habitat and a pine oak habitat. And then um, what we did for this goal sheet was take the, the areas that we all agreed on, or we're pretty close in agreement on, and, we, and I wrote them all out on a sheet. And then these additional and other goals are the bottom third of our um, specific landowner um, goals sheets, which are page two of the, f the first part of each forest stewardship plan. Um, okay. So then we have a series of questions. And the questions, so I'm going to, um, I've got a couple of things to say, and then we're, we're going to, we wrote some questions out to start the, um, start the discussion, and then we've had some really great questions that we've been discussing so far, and we can keep going with that if people want to. So as part of our forest stewardship plan, um, part of the requirements of applying and receiving the forest stewardship plan is for the landowners to think about these goals that we're talking about. And on the standard form, some of these goals seem scary because, in part, there are landowners hearkening back to the days of settlement where you kept 25 or 35 acres of your 200 acre farm. That was your woodlot, and that's how you heated your house. Um, so they talk about cutting trees all the time, and that's, and the, the practice of forestry talks about cutting trees. But in the practice of forestry, how you cut the forest can create habitat. So we don't, we're not interested in cutting the forest. We have this big chunk of land, and the stewardship plan taught us that, that we're actually a unique chunk of land, and one of Jeff's slides showed that. We're this big green spot out there in the middle of a lot of suburban landscape. So uh, what we also learned is that mature forest is home to some species of concern of birds, and that's partly what started to really drive our thinking about the stewardship plan, and let's think about it, the forest, a different way. Um, so. But in part, if you go out and do a harvest, one of the other things you look at is not taking out the big, big trees or even the timber trees, but you're taking out certain areas to create a light opening in the forest for regeneration to happen. So when we talk about doing that, that's the type of harvesting we do, and there's several different types, which we, we're not going to go into today. We can go into, we're like years away from doing this, but we're, we can go into it another day because there's some specific ones, and one of them is actually to help bring back first growth forests um, or old growth to create that type of succession out in the forest. Um, okay, so our assessments that we got done could tell us that the forest ecosystem was out of balance, it was not very healthy and it's not regenerating. That lack of regeneration is creating lack of 
usable habitat, foraging food, nesting, and shelter sites for all creatures, not just birds. The second unhealthy piece is that there is a lack of diversity, both in species, families, and in their sheer numbers. The other part of that lack of diversity, diversity is structural, and in particular, the lack of regeneration of saplings, a lack of shrubs, and also t a lot of perennial plants. Before we had the forest stewardship plan and the assessments done, we just didn't know. It was pretty, it was beautiful, we liked walking out there, so now we know. So the last thing I'm going to share with you is the recent storms in the Northeast, preceded by the summers of 2016 drought, and a drought last year that wasn't as bad, but was coupled with a bad winter moth and gypsy moth outbreak, infestations, those have taken their toll on the forest and on our landscapes. In the recent past few weeks and days, we've cleared trails of many trees, some of them really good size, 12 to 16 inch diameter of breast height, which is about this, this height here. And, um, and what's worse is 80 or so of a smaller caliper tree at two and a half inches to five inches diameter breast height have been completely snapped off. And then there are just many, many, many smaller saplings completely bent over. So what we've had is a major storm event in the forest. So we're going to get a lot of light pockets happening in our forest, but what we need is to have that regenerating forest make it, because otherwise we're gonna start losing the forest. Okay, so on that unhappy note, we can open up our Q&A. <laughs> and if people have questions, they could uh, ask with the mic, please. Thanks, just a, a quick uh, uh, question that actually may be useful for this afternoon. We've got some trails to clear in the SVT land that we're gonna clear out some of the down limbs and so forth. Is it uh, advisable when we're doing that to uh, build, if you will, sort of little critter piles or piles of, of sticks rather than dispersing in the woods? Uh, my assumption is yes, but I wanted to get your opinion on that. Yes, please. That creates awesome habitat. And actually leaving that material on the floor. So there's two pieces to that. Leaving all the cut wood on the floor of the forest is good because it will rejuvenate uh, the soil and it provides home for certain creatures. Don't get too carried away about taking stuff down, though. We, we don't want people to be in danger on the trails, but all that structure that's still stuck and up, that's also homes up above the forest floor that are safe homes and trees as um, people like the woodpeckers go after the beetles that are starting to, you know, they're like, ooh, we've got a lot of food out there. But then there's cavity holes in those trees that provide all kinds of um, f nesting sites for many different creatures. Right, but people don't normally understand, you know, nature's messy. I mean, it's, you know, so. And, and you can do either. You, you either just scatter the or create piles. We have to use a microphone so the TV. Sorry, I was it. just going to say that you can either scatter them or create piles and both have different benefits. Uh, as I'm out clearing uh, the trails, especially after these storms, and, and Mike and I have done a lot, uh, the, the, it's safety that we're keying in on. So if there are snags up there that are off the trail, we're not too concerned about them. But if, if it's a snag that somebody may, you know, land on somebody's head, if they mess with it, now we're taking them down. So that's what keys us. Yeah, it's just, uh, I mean, I got educated here because uh, I didn't know uh, what deer ate and, and uh, whether it was good or bad or what. But the key thing that I learned from this was that when the six females came into my front yard and ate all the small leaf rhododendron in holly, that's an immediate indicator that that group is in real trouble. Okay, so I'm just a neighbor. So to what degree, we've got our, our kind of growing nascent neighborhood uh, association, but... Uh, it seems to me that, like the boundary uh, uh, owners are really important for two reasons. One is they're the ones who give permission to get within the 500, and they're the ones who generally don't know what's going on. I mean, I don't. I, I knew there was a problem, but I never knew this. So to what degree does one organize the, the people around these properties on the edges? Because when the deer are in trouble, they come out. And, so you, and also, we could key in the hunters. I mean, to some degree, you can say they're right here. And so organizing the neighbors seems to be important. 
Is there anything being done systematically there? Uh, so from a, from a statewide, as far as our agency, no. Um, we don't really get into the weeds as far as those types of communities over and above like this type of thing. Of, so like my position is, as the Deer and Moose Project Leader, to provide the expertise um, to help communities make informed decisions. Whether, whatever decisions you make from here, um, you know, it's, it's really up to you, but um, I'm just hoping that I'm answering everyone's questions. But there are a lot of communities that have helped, um, you know, do these types of things. So, for instance, one of them, um, a good example was near the Blue Hills, there was a community off of Green Street, which is on the, the, uh, the western side of the Blue Hills Reservation. And for the past, I want to say, 15 years, they've worked as a, a neighborhood. You know, basically it was one lady that walked around every neighbor, um, told them what was going on, that there's too many deer eating all their shrubs, and that they, uh, they all s agreed to have hunters all within the 500 feet of, of their homes. And um, they were taking about 13 to 17 deer a year off of that street, which is a lot of deer. And so they were able to make a little impact. Um, and so it, a lot of times it comes down to one person that's really active to do all the work, okay. all the legwork. So, so given the activist, then what you need is resources. So when you're talking to the people down the street, you need to be, you can't discuss with everyone, but you need to point somewhere where there's a good resource that they can go on the web and just see, here's the problem. Is, okay. Do you have something like that? Or? Um, can I? Sure. Um, so um, there's something called the West Suburban Conservation Count, uh, collaboration that Sudbury Valley Trustees has been supporting and it is a regional group that's trying to address various uh, conservation issues um, including um, concerns about forest health where there's deer overabundance. Um, so on our and we can send we have I think all of your emails and the sign up we can send out some information uh, to link you to that and I don't know if there's specific references that you'd want to have, but um, I have certainly have had um, Michael in the orange, orange red sh uh, shirt there has helped us to organize some of the neighbors in your neighborhood, Jeff. So um, that also, but in terms of what you would like to know, could you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, right. Well, well, I mean, being a, a kind of political campaigner as well, and knowing how to get elected with no one knowing you, the key thing is. Uh, to have a website somewhere with information or then you can you know, drop flyers along a street and point them. You've got to have a place to send people back to where it will make the case really quickly okay. and it has to have some uh, believability and like particularly here we have the state uh, in also town uh, resources so if we can go back to a number of links that says here's the state's position on this, here's, here's six points that okay. matter uh, yeah, that kind of thing, I'm thinking of how does one get that yeah, involved. Yeah, Actually, I was wondering if we could get a copy of your PowerPoint. There's some yeah. slides in there that are, a picture is a thousand words, <laughs> that are really right. helpful. Um, and yes, we do have some of those resources. We have a toolkit for towns, and we have a toolkit for land trusts who are interested in managing their forests and, the, and deer management. Um, but I think what you've just said is important, and we can... Uh, actually fine-tune what we have there right I think I think Laura it's a level up from what you did for us when we had our our local uh, uh, you know couple street meeting you came you provided context and then we invited the one hunter that we've had for the last two years bow hunter and he talked about what he would do and where he would hunt and that put everybody at ease but it's how do we have a how do we point to resources to level up anyway that's it so i can actually answer part of that um first of all one of the most powerful things for people to do especially nowadays is if you're passionate about an issue is talk to your neighbors and organize like some of you seem to be doing um one of the things that we've talked about because people are concerned they don't understand um, the deer impacts and it's hard to see them if you don't understand what's in the forest and what you're looking at is um, we need to do some fundraising to create what I'm going to refer to as deer exclosures and I've actually done them uh, I have a garden design business but I've actually fenced people's property to keep deer out so you can 
what you do is create an area for the forest to regenerate, and then the deer can't get at it. So then you see what happens inside. Um, and we need to do that. We need to do some citizen science work where we have assigned people going out on a regular basis to monitor what they're seeing in the plots. And we're going to have to collect this data for probably a couple of years. It's not a short-term thing. Um, but that will tell us that where we're keeping the deer out, we're, the forest is regenerating on its own. Or are we really in a problem where we have to help the forest regenerate, like collecting oaks, um, oak seeds and things like that from other places and throwing them out there or throwing them into deer exposure areas. Um, if, you know, there are people who can do website work and things like that, that is one of the things that's really crucial, is having those sorts of resources. Because what we'd like to be able to do is to be able to definitively say, we know we have impacts happening from deer, and we know we have impacts happening from, like, invasive plants or invasive insects. We haven't even touched on those. There are programs we're going to offer later this year. Yes. Wait, wait. <laughs> So you're talking about different projects, and how, how is that information disseminated, and how would you well, get to hear about volunteers for those projects? We, we can do, for this event, we did, we actually, which is unusual, we did what I call snail mailing, and then we did a lot of emailing. And then there, on various and sundry boards, the information, you know, all electronic, was, was up for people to see. We did a little bit of publicity in the paper, I haven't heard a lot about it, and I don't know if that's actually, if people have seen it. Can you refer people to your website? So one of the ways that you could get information about our meetings in particular is um, if you go to Ashland Mass Town Forest, we have a website there, and all of the information about the forest stewardship plans are up there for both Kawasek Woods and ourselves. And as much information, we have videos from a presentation we did earlier. Um, that are still up there, things like that. So we've got a lot of background information. The sky's the limit. There's tons of information out there. And, but what we're trying to do is start to mobilize people. So that's one of the ways we're doing it is more of the events we're doing this year. Um, and there'll be invasive plants, and we hope invasive insects in the fall, unless the person who works for the state is too busy, in which case we'll do it in early spring. So do people have other questions or... Um, should we run through these questions and see if people have uh, thoughts? Like, there's a lot of people who aren't. So there's a questions document on your handouts. Uh, well, in a generic way. Just one more thank you for David Stainbrook, who has not only been ill this week, but has two very young children he needs to go home to. <laughs> thank you. If you have any other questions, um, I'm sure Kathy will forward my information, um, my contact information. And um, more about your question, it seems like there might be a need for, for our agency to do a better job on our website of providing that information. It's kind of one of those things I wanted to do, but it just, there's only one of me. Um, <laughs> And so hopefully in the near future, we'll have some, something on our website for communities just like this, kind of a, uh, a guide. Um, it was kind of an, we wanted to make like a, a pamphlet or a booklet for suburban um, communities. There's, there's a general one for all northeastern communities that, that we can certainly point you to called Suburban Deer Management Guide. Um, it's, you know, just kind of goes through all the options, but it's not so specific that it goes through the kind of stuff that we talked about today, like the discharge setbacks and how to get around that stuff. You know, that I think is what you really want, right? Yeah, we have so, an organizer guy. Yeah. Yeah. There's something on the web, you can, I mean, there's 5,000 people in my district. Exactly. You can engage all of them. Yeah, something that, that answers all these questions. So that'll be something that we'll have to try to develop, and I think it'll be... It'll be good. But thank you guys. If any, anybody has any other questions, just email me in the, in the future, and... Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, um, so some of the things in in the forest stewardship plan um, that are on the table 
are doing some har um, harvesting of trees to open up areas, to get better diversity, to get more structure, improving both insect and bird habitat. Um, another aspect is the deer, which we have some very clear indicators of deer impacts out there. We know that the population is too high and it's a question. Um, so that's, so there's an issue of shade, there's an issue of deer, uh, there's an issue of invasive plants, and we're hoping that the community can come together to see what those issues are, because I think many people, when they see that the forest is green, they think it's okay, but when you look a little bit closer, there are different aspects that are not right or out of balance. So we are hosting a walk on June 10th. Yes, it's in the schedule. Yeah, in your schedule of events, um, and we'll be looking at some of those issues. But, um, so if there are other questions or thoughts that um, folks have about how to move forward with management and what you would suggest or what you're concerned about. Or if you had questions about um, some of the specifics about the forest stewardship, like did you hear something here and you didn't quite understand it today? Yes, um, we might for the mic, please. <laughs> Thanks. You had mentioned informally when we were speaking that your goal and hope is to, at some point, approach um, town meeting for funding. Yes. Yes. Eventually, so, well, there's a, a combination of things. There's okay. grants, but there's also funding for some of the maintenance. So, this is a almost 600 acre parcel of land, which is a huge land mass. On one of Jeff's slides. You could see how unique it was because there just aren't that many big um, public land masses in our area um, like that. Um, so in addition to keeping the trails cleared, uh, we've got a lot of structures out there that are getting renovated and put back out. We've got brand new kiosks at trailheads. We're adding more parking over on Oregon Road. Um, on this far side, The Clark property, we've just, we're in the process of getting the state to approve the conservation restriction. And then at this past, just past fall town meeting, we bought another piece of property. And there's a whole series of trails and more map posts and kiosks that have to go out there. And that's just so people can walk out there and enjoy the forest. And then what we'd like to do is start expanding on our educational program so people understand the resource. And then there's the whole management piece. Now, for some of the management, the actual management pieces, if we were going to do management cuts out there to create more habitat, the first piece of that is actually the deer exclosures, I think, because then we can show people, here's what will native or naturally regenerate if we exclude the deer. And then the second piece is um, we also have to sort of, we have to be monitoring for invasive plants and removing those as much as possible when we have the opportunities and also for invasive insects, which is why we're starting with those to address those first. Um, because any number of those things can decimate the bulk of the habitat out here in our forest. So there's Asian longhorn beetle, their favorite trees are maple. That, all that light green, a lot of that's maple. And there's a couple more maps up there that go into more detail about the specific habitats. And then there's um, emerald ash borer. And maple is on there again, the oaks, and we've already seen the damage that gypsy moths and winter moths do to everything. They just eat the buds of trees. So, you know, you can't, it can't happen by itself. Um, and right now we've had a committee of three active members for a really long time. Now we have four. We're looking for more people to step up. So if anybody wants to be on our committee, please let us know. Um, you know, and other people who don't, might not want to be on a committee but want to get involved in these other work parties and things like that, this is what we're starting to develop. And we've got a Friends of the Forest list. Mm -hmm. and We started to develop that list in part to get people out in the forest. We also want to know, when I mean, you're going out there, you're having fun. So what did you see? Did you see salamanders? Did you see uh, the little spring peepers that are out? Yay. Uh, birds? You know, we're looking for those pictures because in the ideal world, we'd have somebody posting that stuff on a Facebook page um, on a regular basis, hey, this could, we found this out in the forest today. You know, because that's the fun stuff. That's why we all go out there and use it. So 
I'm sorry. I said that was a long answer. That That's you know. Right. But this is hello. Um, so once you figure out budgetarily what kind of funding, I mean, obviously you, you've got to We've sort of get a, a budget. We have a yeah. nascent idea of okay. maintenance funding for but every year. Will that be like matched through the the what are the the CPA funds? Would you not get matching funds for that? The CPA can't be used for maintenance. Yes, it can. Well, not as I've been That's, told. It can be used for. I believe maintenance for playing fields, but what we are getting hmm. CPA monies for is to do the initial, all the work we're doing out in the Clark and the Nicolo properties, oh, that yeah. thing disappeared again, um, are all of that new infrastructure is getting taken care of. Okay. There was some damage done to the forest when the water lines went in, that work is getting fixed by CPA funds. Okay. And we're also, um, in the process of installing new um, additional map posts in some places out there. Uh, you know, the other problem we have is people are vandalizing them, which is why some of them are down. Mm -hmm. And um, we also have people out there spray painting, so it would be great if you would ask people to not spray paint the rocks or the trees in the forest, because they are actually are also habitat. So um, in one of the areas over in the Blue Trail section, there's a lot of, um, uh, it's a, a rock, um, a specific rock lichen that's um, a, like a leather that's really cool. I forget the name right now. Um, and there's rocks over there that have been spray painted. We can't, you know, if we clean those rocks off, there's nothing we can clean those rocks off that belongs out there in the forest. So we're just going to have to let the paint dissipate naturally. And the same is true for the bark of the trees. We can't go and scrape paint off the bark of the trees. So we'd rather people not be using the forest as a billboard for their causes. You know, there's plenty of other things you can use. So that's some of what we need maintenance money for. <laughs> Thank you. So do people have other questions about how this might happen or, uh, or what we're thinking about in terms of the stewardship plan? And you can always email us and ask us questions. Mm -hmm.